morning. I'm going to start the recording. So as we um, we were starting to talk about the presentation, and I've worked through a lot of them. And hi, there's my doggy. I don't know if you can see him. There he is. Um, Troublemaker. Huh? <laughs> I said, what a troublemaker. He oh, looks he so cute. Oh, he is six months old. <laughs> I'm 50 pounds. That's crazy. Oh. Um, yeah, he's very cute. Um, and so what was I saying? Oh, the presentation. So I, I went through the ones that came up that were uploaded. So that was great. A lot of them look really good. Um, as a is a draft, right? So I didn't. Most people did not get any points, and that doesn't mean they weren't good. It's just I don't give partial points. I only give zero or, or the whole thing. And one one ten twenty pointer is basically for the references, and that's um, you know everybody should have five references, so not the group, everybody, and that's not that hard to do. I'm not going to be that picky about you know journals or this or that i'm mostly interested in you collecting data from multiple sites so that way you have sort of a cross section of ideas and not just copy down one person's ideas um so that's partly because of that uh where was the other thing oh i think it's in here the school text um the other thing that often I would like people to do a little bit less is not write full sentences, but like put down the, um, well, you can you can write full sentences, but make sure you don't just end up reading the sentence when you make the video, because then it's not really teaching. And so what I prefer you do for most of us is have the, the, the main keywords kind of in a sentence or so or in a line and have bullet points and then have images to help explain it. And then during the video, you know, the images are much more memorable for when you watch it versus just seeing text and it's just words. But most of us, that makes it more confusing in that. So if you reference an image to the words that you're using and cut out the end buts and the ifs and just have the main point described, then uh, in the video, you basically describe a picture, uh, which then is visually much more memorable in terms of, at least for a lot of us. I mean, if you do a great job any way, other way, that's, you know, great. That's just what I sort of, how I develop my way over the years. Um, and so I'm trying to at least give you a baseline. Because making presentations, if you go to college, that's just something that is good to know how to do a little bit. Um, so pictures is the one thing, visualizations and keywords, bullet points. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, add a little more detail and I try to annotate. The problem is if I if I, I annotated the first in the series, I, I what I didn't ask for is to say in everybody say who's doing which part. And so I annotated one person's and then you got to bring back to the group. But I wrote to the other people that I annotated that one person. And if you have questions, just text me and reach out and we can go through it together. Um, but basically, some people add a little bit more description, explaining the, the detail and explaining the disease. Like, for example, like who, who is likely to get it? You know, how many people are sort of affected? Uh, signs and symptoms. A lot of you guys do all of that. But some some of you guys would be good to have a little bit more of that data. Progression. How does it develop? Prognosis, how does it look later on? Uh, you know, are people recovering or people not recovering from this thing and how? Risk factors is always another one that's really good, especially in a presentation that, you know, you want to explain something to someone else who hasn't really uh, heard about it or understands what it is. Um, and the other sections, often I feel like in medications or in surgical the conventional med medicine approach, which often leads to, you know, medication and surgery, uh, a, a little bit the mechanism of action of like pills. Same in the disease. Also, if it's like, let's say it's it's COVID or so, the mechanism of how does that work? What does it do to the body? What are the consequences? And you don't need to use the big, big words. I don't really want the big words. I want it explained so people can visualize it. That's why the images come in so much, because you want to I, when I wrote my class, I tried to explain it to my 12-year-old at that point, 
And if she understands it, I figured out I can, you know, do it in class uh, for, you know, early college stuff. And so it's, it's like you want to be able to explain it to people. But then you can go into a little bit more details. And generally, it's the mechanism of the pathology or the mechanism then of action of medication or what does the surgery do. <clears throat> and again, a lot of you guys do great work. Uh, these are just some points that came up for me. And then at the end of the day, too, uh, the part three also similar, you know, the, the the part how you can support yourself, how you can help yourself to aid the process or, or diminish the implications. Uh, also explain a little bit if you find what does something do? What is known that an herb does, uh, for example? Not, you know, it's not. And again, read through a few references be, you know because it's it's not you you don't want to do the sort of complementary portion of your medicine as the only medicine you want to work together with your doctor about these things but a lot of these things if you come with some knowledge and you teach us a little bit of hey how what do we think a mint tea does why does it help or a chamomile tea or a, you know or a tincture of some sort that clears up the lungs when you have the pneumonia, you know, oh, it clears up the lungs. It takes away the phlegm and so, so forth. So do a little reading on that, on those things and, 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 and give us a little bit of the mechanism of action if you haven't done so. And then I like the sort of, when I read that five and five rule, uh, five words per line, five lines per slide, you know, break up the slides. That's, you know, don't put too much info on a slide because you can always move to the next slide. And that's, you know, that's um, easy. So that's why I don't really want to answer the how many slides, but at least you're probably going to have five, six to 10 slides or so per question, depending on who, what you're doing. But break it up. Don't have too much info. And, and the pictures with text in them, make those pictures a little bit bigger so we can actually read the text and you can reference, like a list of foods that help with something or a list of herbs if you find a nice picture of that that do that. So. Anyway, that's about all I have. And then the next step will be the video. And I want you guys to start thinking about what format you want to do the video in. So I'm thinking, you know, Zoom, if you have a Zoom account and you get all the three people on Zoom and then you share and you make it so everyone can share on the call, then everybody can just go through the thing like we do it here. As long as you make sure you put the right PowerPoint on. <laughs> Not like uh, what I sometimes do. Um, or the other thing we can also talk about if you feel like you could do the screencast matic which I think is a free account, where you can um, where you can make a video of your screen, which means you can make a video of your PowerPoint level screen and you can you know measure it and make a thing around it, uh, a border, and then upload. So that will be individually you do them and then upload them. One person uploads them on a YouTube, and and get some done that way. That would be a, a thing or or even doing that through YouTube. I don't know how you can connect videos on YouTube or how you can do a screen video of YouTube or just with a camera. <clears throat> but the screencast of Mastic is another one that came to mind and I did my early stuff with that. That works pretty well. So if you're interested in that, reach out. Uh, if you have questions with that, you know, start thinking about it. How are you going to do that? Do the second draft if you haven't gone points. Um, a few of you, a few have gotten everything so well done that I don't need to worry about a second draft. But this is sort of the time to get back to me. Re-upload when you have something because then I see very fast that, oh, you've done something. I can go in and look at it and, and give it another critique or say, hey, that looks great. And let's go work on a video now. And if you've already gotten the 40 points, then, you know, go start working on the video or, or work with the group members a little bit that haven't gotten the points yet. Uh, some people gotten the, the points for references, others uh, haven't. And some of them I'm probably was uh, still a little wishy-washy, but uh, uh, who got it? Because I'm not always sure who did which part. Anyway, so that's a part of the, the PowerPoint, the presentation, the pathologies. Talk to uh, any questions to that. No? All right. Then uh, we can continue uh, and go to this week's or last week's material if you want to do that. And if you have anything come up, just holler at me. And I'm right here. Where would my safari have gone? Go oh, look down here. All right. Now I'm to ask, do you guys see my PowerPoint? 
Yes. Good. Thank you. I know I need at least one person at it telling me. I don't know how many people. Oh, we have nine people. That's pretty good. I don't, right. mind. I don't mind. I, I definitely need to hear it. Okay, no, that's good. That's good. We'll do we'll do this. Is this big enough or how can I make it bigger? I can't see that. I can probably make it bigger by making this smaller. All right, at least a little bit. So today we'll or last week you guys did the brain. Ha, have you done the labeling, coloring? How was that for you guys? Any any questions? Any comments on that? Difficulties that you'd like to talk about or no more? There were a couple names that were a little hard to sort of pinpoint on the brain diagrams that I printed out, just in terms of sort of really understanding, you know, exactly where that region was on the on the drawing. But mm -hmm. I, I think I faked my way through it. Yeah, we can definitely touch on those. I know some of them are a little hard uh, for. Um, I I need to go through these homeworks again and see what's around now, or have somebody who can draw well drawn for me because um some of the pictures are just not you know <laughs> they're always a little bit of a challenge yeah. take these damn lines out but if you have to do it you know if i have to do it it takes a long time yeah. and so that's so we can definitely go through all of those terms i have to list in front of me too if you know they come up make sure we we reference back to those as we go through the brain any other questions comments on the homework stuff if not, we can sort of dive into it. We, you know, today we will talk about, or we did talk about the basic nervous structure and then went into a little bit on the skins around the brain to protect the brain, a, a little moment on the development, not too much. That's more in the videos. We can sort of jump over that because as it comes sort of to the labeling, the lab and 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 also the, the functionality, of the brain, I'm looking at it mostly from a perspective of what region of the brain does what in the body, you know, perspective. Um, and so I approach it that way. And so that way, at least I have a little bit of an understanding and attachment to what was that was what. And so that's how I look at it. The brain is really complicated. It's like harder to get a full story, like in the heart system, in the cardiovascular system, we kind of get a much deeper clarity of what it does the brain is very you know plastic and can change and 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 for example there is studies where they've shown that one part of the brain can take over another part like the um um <clears throat> like this one person had vertigo and couldn't dance and they were able to go through the tongue and have her put some chewing gum material on the tongue that gave her different electricity going through the chewing gum and that was she was able to get her balancing system organized that way to the extent where she was able to do dancing ballroom dancing and that sort of stuff is very interesting where one part of the brain takes over the other we see that a lot when people if they're if you have blindness then the occipital lobe which is what is our visual lobe is not used for division and so we can um, get the hearing you know, get that room used for in making the hearing much better and the tactile senses much better. And so that's, you know, how the brain is kind of interesting. It's not that hard. It's not, it's hardwired, but it's not that hardwired in that way. It's sort of like that neuron step fire together, wired together moment where we had last time. I don't think, I think I have that. Yeah, I think we had that in the beginning, in last week where we see um, the nerves, the way they make a pathway and that's sort of a thought so when we use that in psychology or in in thinking about you know happiness and stuff like that like that we're doing i think this week or we did uh yeah we we're still doing it the gratitude journal where where we, we we look at those aspects of how the brain works the thoughts that we do or nerve after nerve after nerve after nerve, and then one part of the brain does a specific thing for that. And so the limbic system, we'll talk about that. Will be, will be the, um, will, will be the emotional brain where the feelings are happening. And the more we have a specific thought or a specific process happen, the nerve fires in sequence. Th those pathways get made strengthened and, and 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 made bigger. And so, uh, 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 and. That's what we call neuroplasticity, where we say the neurons that fire together, wire together, they become real hard wiring. 
Um, and that's how we learn things, and that's how the brain molds and learns and changes. And so it goes to the extent where we can have the tongue help us uh, 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 with the balancing system because we can rewire the brain. And so a lot of it has to do with wiring. Same with, for example, when we get older and we get dementia coming in, uh, in some of us, unfortunately, uh, it's a matter of we can't access the, 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 the stored information. We can't find it anymore. Uh, and that's, the, that's sort of how that works. So it's a lot about the wiring portion. And so that's, and so approaching it for like, what does what part of the lobe do or, or part of the brain do? Uh, you know, a lot of them seem hardwired. Absolutely, they are for us most of the time, but... But again, the occipital lobe is, is foreseeing. And if you don't need that foreseeing, then you can start using it for different parts. So there's, for example, there's studies that show that every part of the brain has almost like a holographic image of another part. They did studies in mice on that. It's like, well, we don't need to talk about those kind of studies, but it's, it's very interesting. Um, anyway, so if we go through it briefly here. We have that basic functioning, and I can't reiterate that more in, enough that's why i'm bringing it back up here where we look at that sort of feedback loop thing we have a receptor on the somewhere on the outside or also on the inside pick up uh pick up some some stretch in here in this situation it's a muscular stretch or it could be calcium for example in the blood or it could be all kind of other things that a receptor can pick up and the receptor can also be then connected to the endocrine system if you look at uh, uh, how that works, how like the calcium in the blood is, for example, the calcium in the blood is very fragile. It needs to be a specific range. And uh, in the in the thyroid and the parathyroid glands, they pick up the level of calcium. And then that depends on how much of the hormone is secreted. Here, the receptor picks up a stretch, for example, or a, or a painful signal, a dangerous signal, uh, or a tactile signal or, or, or temperature, and then translates that into the spinal cord and to the brain um, um, and so that becomes the information that goes into the central nervous system, the spinal cord and the spinal cord and the brain are considered the central nervous system, the CNS. And then the nerves that feed up and then also back down at the other side of it. Um, and in this instance, the, 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 it, you have an information processing going on here in the spinal cord and the spinal cord, the processing says like, oh, we, we need to do something with this muscle. We need to contract this muscle. And so then that becomes a information going out nerve part. And those in and going out nerve, they go through the peripheral nerves, at the peripheral nervous system, we call that. So the system always works in a way that we have a receptor that detects some kind of a change and then sends a information in, a sensory, a sensation stimulus. We also call that afferent stimulus to the central nervous system, and that's the brain and the spinal cord. And central nervous system, you can also consider um, a decision making system, depending on the level of decision making, the hierarchy is that you know, some levels, like uh, if you do a go to the doctor and you do a, uh, in, an impulse where they take the reflex hammer and, and bang on your tendon here, and that creates that stretch, and then that creates the contraction of the muscle, and your leg goes up. That is a reflex that goes at the spinal cord level. That's very rudimentary. Uh, you will get a signal up in the brain too that is like, oh, what happened down here? But often when that actually happened in the doctor's office, I remember it's like I had to sort of see with my eyes that I realized my leg went up. It was much faster than I could conceive of what's going on. And then so reflexes like that are more at the spinal cord level. They're much faster and they're more hardwired too. But when we need integration thinking, higher end thinking, then we go back, always go higher up to the brain. And that's where we can do that thinking. Well, if we actually use the word thinking, then we go definitely are up in the brain. Um, and so that's the CNS. And then that's that processing, the integration. And then whatever happens, whatever the result is, will be sent out via a motor or, or a motor nerve or efferent nerve, E as an exit. And uh, I remember it that way. And that goes to an effector organ. Here, that's a muscle. Here, that's the quadricep muscle that contracts to bring that leg up because we had that stretch up here. So that's the functioning of the nervous system. We can apply that, 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 that template onto all these things that, you know, like the endocrine system to the negative feedback system as a general system, the way things are work. That's why we describe it in the first chapter.
All right, is that pretty clear? Any questions to that? No sound. Clear, Good. clear, sorry. No, no, that's I'm all right. Breakfast. And then, uh -huh. huh? I'm eating breakfast. <laughs> oh, that's good. good. Good appetite. I know I need some lunch after that. <laughs> uh, and then when we look structurally, we already talked about that. We have that central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, I like this slide because everything is described in what the anatomy looks like and what the physiology, what it does. These are the integration centers. And then the peripheral nervous system is, is where the, the information goes in. That's the blue line. And the information goes out. That's the red line. And... <clears throat> And then down in here, we we have uh, the what goes in into the system, the sensory portion of it, the afferent portion or division of it. Those are uh, somatic and visceral sensory nerve fibers. And what that means is somatic refers to body and that refers to muscle. When we think of soma, we think of body. I think you, maybe you have heard of psychosomatic illness or something like that. Um, and so we think of 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 body stuff. And when we think of body stuff, we basically think of the muscular system. And then visceral um, is internal organ. It's the more the organ systems, the other th systems. So we call that more the visceral nervous system. So those are where the, 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 the information from the body, uh, from the muscular system and from the visceral system that goes into the central nervous system. And that's what it says here, what it does, it conducts the impulse. So it travels from the receptor to the CNS, the central nervous system. And then the information gets, um, you know, discussed and whatever needs to happen. And then the, the, the efferent system, the motor part, whatever is then the effect of what needs to happen has a multitude of parts to it. It has a conscious portion. It has a, a muscle moving portion, and we call that the voluntary or somatic nervous system. Soma again is body, and that's the muscle. So the voluntary system is the somatic system um, also. So I kind of equate that together. And then what that system does, it, it creates, uh, it conducts impulses to the skeletal muscles. That's where we have that written down. And then on the other side, we have the visceral system, which is unconscious, which is good. You don't need to think about how deep you're breathing. You don't need to think about how fast your heart rate goes, uh, depending on the activity or emotional state. And so that's, that's an involuntary uh, aspect of the nervous system that just sort of works on its own. And that's very connected also then to the endocrine system via that um, sympathetic division of that portion of the verbal system because that's uh, impulses. Oh, the, the, the A and S, that's what the autonomic nervous system, the involuntary one is called. And then, you know, I just think it's automatic. So the autonomic is automatic in my head. And that goes to heart muscles. That's the cardiac muscles, smooth muscles. That's, um, that's the stomach and that kind of stuff. And the glands and that's wet glands, but it's also some endocrine glands. It can also be well. It's connected to to the, the 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 adrenal gland, the adrenal medulla. We talked about that last week or a couple of weeks back. And so, when we look at what that function is, the the involuntary body adaptation. We, well, that we're looking at then adaptation functions in reality, like we have to adapt to running faster. So we need more oxygen in the system. So depending on what we do, so if we're running then we, we need more, more heart going. We need to pump the, the heart faster and deeper. We need to breathe deeper and breathe faster. And we can think about stuff in that way, what the body function is uh, uh, when we activate this automatic nervous system. And actually that's the sympathetic portion of the autonomic nervous system. It says your emergency situations, that's, you know, that's really accurate, but it's, it's sort of on one side, the extreme this is also the system where we're just alert and we're paying attention to something. That's also the system that works on, in that. So it's we call it the fight or flight nervous system. But that's like we can take more information in because we pay attention to something specific or, or also our heart gets mobilized depending on what we do when we run. Yeah, because we're running when we're thinking heavily or get emotionally, you know, um, 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 a, a crazy or in the head or you know as things get anxious is the word i'm looking for then a heart can go deeper and be faster as well um, and so that's also a sympathetic division 
uh, function. And then on the other extreme, we have the parasympathetic division function. And that's a sort of the division that replenishes um, uh, the energy and the resources used in the alert situation of the body system. Like you think you can think of the sympathetic, like you're on a, dry, on a freeway, you have to drive and you, you really have to pay attention and you can, I, you know, you shouldn't really be eaten when you do that because the, the body systems are not geared to digesting food. They're more geared to making sure you don't have an accident um, and be really fast in reactions and so forth. And so that's a really good example of the sympathetic state. And then the parasympathetic state is, is the really, you know, good example is med if you meditate and you breathe deep and you, you conserve energy and build and build the resources back up that used up in the sympathetic system. So I think that's actually an important portion when we talk about these states, because in our modern life, more and more, we you know, stressed out and no time and all of that. And even if we do it on our own self, because we're on, you know, TikTok too long or something, the sympathetic, or we actually don't go to sleep when we're tired because we just keep staring at that blue screen. At least put your blue screen to non-blue screen at night. So it doesn't keep activating your being awake cells. But that's always sympathetic state. And we're really heavily in that sympathetic state. We, 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 we use up the body's resources and we don't give it enough conserving or rebuilding resources, the parasympathetic state. So that's why one reason why minimalistically to get a little more in here, if we can think of doing, you know, five deep breath and holding the breath and breathing out and holding a little, do like five of those deep ones a couple of times a day, that alone will make a big difference and help us be less stressed, more oxygen in the system, and we can rebuild our ATP resources more, probably also better thinking. It's a well-spent minute to do that. So I'm, I know I was a little confusing in this discussion, but did you guys, does that make sense? Yes, yeah, it definitely drew it together. It took me a second to kind of figure out, but then you brought it back together and you were talking about the symp sympathetic. So it, good, the good. fight or flight, I was kind of like, okay, where are we going? <laughs> No, I know, I know. I'm sorry. Well, because it's always, it's it's really just, it's a good diagram because it brings everything together. And so yeah. there is some slides at the end, I think of not to today's class, but next uh, weeks that we talk a little bit more about the sympathetic and parasympathetic. But I like, I like to view it in a way of like using energy versus rebuilding energy. Because I think in our life that makes, gives a much more, you know, urgency to things like you got to take a day off at some point and just chill out and not always be running around um, because we have a tendency to do that. And that's really well described here why we, you know, that's important. Um, and then the other, the next thing we do is we go, well, and I guess the other thing that's interesting here to make sure we separate the somatic from the visceral, the automatic situation, voluntary, involuntary. I think those are some good points on this slide. And then we 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 have to consider to protecting the brain. I I talked about the 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 way that the brain is about pathways and neuron after neuron after neuron. And that's very moldable. And so we call that word is neuroplastic. And plastic, we've all, you know, the word plastic comes actually from being moldable. Um, and so the brain is very malleable and very soft. It's like spaghetti type soft, like not al dente, like bad spaghetti. Um, um, and so it needs to be really, really well protected because if you take a fist and you punch into it, you're going to make a hole into that damn thing. And that's just not good enough to not be protected by a bone on the outside. That's the skull and also the spinal cord or the spinal column, the bony parts that we talked about. And then underneath the bone, you got a few membranes. You got one membrane that's known as the dura mater. That's a very tough, thick, fibrous membrane that you can actually, as you take this one of those out, you can see the fibers, the collagen fibers. They can be very strong. And that dura mater <clears throat> has underneath it, 
a membrane right here that's known as the arachnoid motor and arachnoid means spider and the arachnoid motor is much more delicate and has little legs going down right onto the brain basically um, from a distance and in between here we got a fluid called the cerebrospinal fluid and it's around the entire brain and also goes to the inside of the brain a little bit um <clears throat> it also has internal chambers where that fluid goes but it makes the brain sort of weightless because if we don't have that fluid the brain is so soft that gravity will make it collapse and so that's not really a great thing we don't want that we uh, some some rare occasions happen when you get an epidural in childbirth, for example, um, and the needle penetrates that membrane at the spinal cord level down below. So it's 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 not you know it's far away. You're not going to poke into the spine into the brain, but down there below you can then go into that space in between and and squeeze some medicine in there and, and numb the nerves coming out. But one, when we take the needle out, once in a blue moon, that hole that the needle makes doesn't cover up fast enough and that fluid drains out. And those people have to sort of be in bed more and can't be upright for a while because when the fluid drains out of the brain a little bit because that hole leaks, then that brain sort of collapses a little and that's, that hurts, that's painful. And so... <clears throat> That's one way where we can sort of understand what one of the things that that does or the brain, you know, collapsing thing. Um, and the other thing that's interesting with these spidery legs, uh, underneath that spidery legs, we have the delicate called the peel motor. And that's sort of a shiny film right on top of the brain. If you see your brain and it's shiny, that's what you actually see is the peel motor. And um, these spidery legs, besides having the fluid in and making the space, they also act like springs. And that's one of the discussions when they talk about concussions um, in, in the football thing. They, you know, per, but also you have to be careful with too many headers. With, like if the kids play soccer with a big ball and they, sh you know, not their size ball and they do headers, you got to be careful with that too, because the brain pulling away from that pia motor arachnoid motor complex here that can cause brain problem and brain damage and that's the one word in the ct that i forgot the word the, the chronic football you know brain problems that they then look at the brains of the football players who pass away later and they see these brains are like you know very in bad shape and it's the it's apparently the pulling away and then smashing back against that the, 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 the skull inside of the brain is what causes the damage, but the pulling away is apparently a really big component of it. So that was interesting. I didn't know that at first. Anyway, we shouldn't have to go to that macabre, but I, that's where you like, you, you learn about the, the protections, really, the meninges, they call them, the meninges, those three membranes. Mm -hmm. So now you know the system. You see a lot of stuff comes in threes. Like if we're going to look at the gut tube, it's going to be three layers. If you look in a blood vessels, it was three layers. So three is an important number in this in this body stuff. And then developmental, um, we, we basically start as a spinal cord. And then where the brain is, it gets bigger and things accumulate. And then it folds around a few times. And then that becomes the brain. But what's interesting is you've got the spinal cord and then the inside of the brain is where we have a lot of the functions that are automatic functions. We don't think about it. And the hindbrain is the cerebellum, which is where we have the functions uh, like balancing, but also organ, you know, planning kind of stuff in there as well. So balancing and planning out and executing type functions. Very, very interesting part of the brain. Um, and then as we get higher up, sort of further up to the top, which is the end point here, we, we're going to have more integrated functions where like, the, for example, the sensory nervous system comes in there and they send the information from there. There's a synapse and then send the information to the different parts of the brain. That would be the thalamus. It's a relay station. So that's, if you look at old um, or, 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 you know, poorly quality video that's pixelated, Often it's like in the old internet, you like get a few pixel and a little more pixel and then a little smaller, finer pixel. At some point you recognize what's going on and who you see. 
and that's sort of like I, I I think of the the what how the thalamus picks up consciousness is sort of like the the really sh the not pixelated pixel picture yet that we can recognize yet, but we kind of see oh it's maybe a face it kind of thing versus you know we don't know exactly who and what and do we know them etc how old etc like that. So that's what sort of goes on here. And then from there, we get the, the, the lobes, the cortex, the highest region. And that's where we have a lot of the consciousness. And that's where we have the different lobes. And if we go into the different lobes, we go right into, um, where are we with the different lobes? Here, we could do that. We have a frontal lobe here. And then these are the descriptions of those lobes. The frontal lobe is where, where all the motor sort of stuff happens. Um, um, and that's uh, um, the execution, the thinking, the problem solving, the judgments, all of that stuff happens in here. So if we really do the thinking, that's really in the forehead. So if you're like really thinking hard and scratch your forehead, you're really working on that part of the brain. And who knows, it probably helps a little with the, energy in your broad cells that pull the electricity towards an area. We don't know what all works. I mean, some of the stuff that I learned to do on, on muscles, I'm like, how the heck is that going to work? But it does. So it's really strange. Um, so anyway, I'm that's what the frontal lobe the is. And then we have a parietal lobe, and that's more to the back. That's where, where we have most of the volunt No, that's where we have most of the here. Sorry, this one. Most of the the sensations coming in to the brain from all the different body parts. And we actually have it, we have an area in that part of the brain that's right here. That's known as the primary somatosensory area. That's the place where all the information comes up to first. And then from there, it gets distributed to different parts of 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 what we do with that information, so that the processing happens then further down in the deeper parts of the brain. So this is an interesting situation, and how the brain is structured fundamentally is it's got these these gray areas on top or on the outside. In the spinal cord, it's reversed, but brain in the brain is on the outside, and those are cell bodies. And then the white part, the wider part is known, that's known as gray matter, and then this is known as white matter. And the white matter are, are organized axons, basically, tracts and dendrites, the extensions that go from the neurons out, and some extensions go all the way up and down towards the muscles, for example, and some extensions then go from lobe to lobe, from area to area. And so you have, uh, uh, for example, then you get the information coming in to that primary area where you feel the touch, for example, from the body areas. Um, and, and yeah, and the, 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 the parietal lobe is mostly for things like touch, temperature, and pain um, uh, sensations that come from most of the parts of the skin. Um, and you see where we can outline that on an area right in the brain and we can map that and we can poke, take a brain skull off and poke people there in those areas. And that's what they sense. They sense like, oh, somebody's pushing me on my thumb right here. If you push right in here, in this specific area. And that's the second part of the organization. The brain is organized with little peaks and then little valleys and then some deep valleys. And I describe the Gyro and the sulci, where are those described? Here, the, the gyri or gyrus is one of these wiggles that stick up. So if we actually look at the brain, that's sort of the view we have of the brain as, as we understand the brain from seeing it from the outside. And so we see these wiggles and these are known as gyri and the, 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 the small little valleys are known as sulci, those grooves. And then we do have a few deep sulci, and those are called fissures. They go all the way up, up and down. And the big fissure that we actually really worry about, or not worry, concern us with in this initial discussion is the one that separates then the brain from right to left hemisphere. And what's and that those that fissure goes all the way down, and you can really pull the brain apart to the right side and to the left side, and you have two parts to it. 
And so that really does exist, those two physical parts. Um, and what's interesting about that is there is tracks that go across from side to side. And those tracks are known to be much bigger in the female brain uh, and then in the male brain. They're not as well developed in the male brain. And again, that's not necessarily women, men, but it's the tendency in those um, brains, depending on, on how the brain, uh, you know, is made, you know, you're going to get overlap, but generally speaking, and that often has to do in the regular world and life is that the male brain is, is horrible at multitasking and the female brain generally is much better at that. And evolutionarily speaking, we can go back to, you know, the male brain, the, the men had their bigger muscles. So they had to go hunt for the animals to then eat and the women or the female, the, the people with, you know, a little less muscle mass had to stay home and made sure that the house is in order and to go to cave or whatever and the kids taken care of. So all these different tasks and stay and make it safe at home, for example. And so that sort of where evolutionarily we can sort of describe that. But again, these are generalizations, these are tendencies. This doesn't necessarily apply to every single person. Uh, and so that's um, what well, that's kind of interesting about that. And the other thing is that hemispheric thing with the fissure. But that brings me back to then um, the parietal lobe and and this place where we have that 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 mapping of everything, and that's known as the primary somatosensory cortex, and that's right here behind a, 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 a sulcus that we think of often and that we often show in the brain as a colored area, and that's the central sulcus right here. Um, and then behind it is that primary somatosensory. Professor, I think somebody had a question on whether oh. um, is gray matter and matter the same thing, Jeffrey? Gray matter uh, and I... white matter. We separate gray matter from white matter. And so and thanks, can... that's actually yeah. great. If you can keep the so, questions going, then you can or, you could help me with that. Yeah, yeah, sometimes sometimes, you, sometimes you say me. As well, page 19 yeah, sometimes... explains that. It does? Yeah, on in our booklets we have on page nineteen, it explains the cerebrum, and then it um, explains gray matter and white matter and gray nuclei as well. But it, I guess what I'm seeing uh, is sometimes it's M A T E R. Sometimes I see M A T T E R. Right? That's that the same variations. Okay, that's what I meant. Okay. Yeah, that's the same. That's do we okay. do we spell it in English, <clears throat> English or in Latin or in whatever? Oh, okay. In the yeah, yeah, that's that's also when you see on my slides, I try to cr put a lot of AKAs in if I yeah. if different spelling, because when I learned anatomy first, it drove me nuts to not know, is it a different thing or is it the same thing? Okay. Um. So I totally appreciate the, that that issue with that. But is that, was that the question? Yeah, I just, I, I kept seeing both variations and I just was getting confused. Okay, okay. No, no, that's great. Yeah, please. And yeah, if, if somebody could, if somebody types it in the text instead of interrupting me, then if somebody else catches it, please just interrupt me so we can go over these questions. Um, we were talking now about the hemispheres a little bit, and then we we're sort of walking our way through the different lobes of the brain as we learn all these pieces to it. And so we did the parietal lobe, and that's mostly associated with that body awareness, the the the, um, the touch, the temperature, the pain, and the area where we get that information coming in initially is is that blue area here, and we con we call that the post central sulcus because it's behind post is behind the central, I mean gyrus because it's behind the post central sulcus, and that's the area that I mentioned here, that line here is the central sulcus. And, and what we have in that wiggle behind it is that area where the sensory information from the body comes in first. And then from there, it goes to different parts of that brain as integration happens. And so that's, um, there is primary areas, there's tertiary areas. We talk, we look at it here in here. This is a good picture for that, where you have a, a primary um, uh, area where you get the um, uh, the information coming in 
from the primary touch type thing and pain and temperature. And then, and then you have association areas and those are areas behind it or surrounding it. And those are then integration areas. So association areas is integration where we get more thinking going on about it. And so we have this is the parietal lobe that we discussed. And then from there, we can go to the temporal lobe. Oh, and wait, real briefly, the, the frontal lobe has that same thing, but this is instead of the, the first place where information comes in, this is the last place information goes out. This is where we then send the action impulse to the, to the, the mouth to speak, to the muscle to move, for example. So this is where the voluntary movement stuff happens uh, from here. And when you look on the brain itself, that's that primary motor area. And that's also known as the pre-central gyrus because pre, pre means before, post means behind. And again, the central sulcus is right here. So that's where we have the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, and then we can go to the visual lobe that's in the back. The visual um, uh, occipital lobe is the, is the visual cortex is in the back. And in the back, we, we have a, a, a taste cortex that's also that's on the bottom here by the parietal lobe. We also have an acoustic center and that's right behind the ear in the temporal lobe. So I'm thinking temporal lobe, acoustic cortex or, 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 or um, hearing. Um, and then we have one more lobe and that's not, as you've noticed, when you look at the skull, all those names are the same names as the skull plates. The temporal, temporal part, the occipital part, bone, uh, are the same names, but then we have one more lobe underneath the temporal lobe, and that's known as the insular lobe, and that's where we have con con uh, where we have uh, consciousness of balance happening. So we call that the vestibular cortex. When we look at cortex, uh, that's sort of the outer shell of everything, and so we're thinking, you know, often we associating cortex with consciousness because that's what happens in the cortex. Not all the cortex, all of in the cortex is conscious. Some of it is integration, but a lot of it is conscious what happens up there. When you go further down in the brain stem, we get to the unconscious parts, like um, uh, the cerebellum is the balancing part, or, or we have the breathing rates and stuff like that. The digestive has some um, fibers coming from there as well. So those are the five lobes that we have that we in the in the test review you'll have you know bullet points associated with their function and then as we go deeper into the into the brain we we have what's called as what the name is ganglia or nuclei um and those are names for cell body clusters in the brain spinal cord and also outside in the periphery uh, we have some cell clusters too in the more modern language, get nuclei are associated with cell clusters in the central nervous system and ganglia in the peripheral nervous system. But it's, you know, language is hard to change. So the basal ganglia is actually in the brain itself. And it's <clears throat> when we look at this picture here with gray and white matter, you see here uh, you have these clusters. These are colored because when they stay in them, they have a little bit of a U to that color, so you can see it here as more grayish. Those, whenever you see gray like that, you know it's cell bodies. Whenever you see whitish like that, you know it's 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 connections, it's axons. It's actually the fat wrapping around the 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 axon, the wire that creates that whitish color. And so these, um, what's interesting about the basal ganglia is that we we have nerve motor nerve fibers get. Get get executed here in the in the precentral cortex, and get basically translated down to the spinal cord to the level of where the nerve then comes out that goes to the muscle. But what happens is this: the basal ganglia uh, is a place where we have rhythmic things, movement patterns stored. And so, for example, the Precentral cortex says, oh, we got to walk over there to turn on the light switch. And then the basal ganglia gets picks up that nerve impulse coming from above, downward, so to speak, through that area and, and, and says, oh, 
we know how walking works. That's a rhythmic motion that like one leg, other leg, other leg. And then we understand, you know, that. Um, 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 then, so then we don't have to always think about everything because the basal ganglia is more unconscious. You can see that when you learn how to drive, you know, first it's really hard. You have to focus on everything. And at some point it becomes all automated or when you learn an instrument or a sport or something, you get better at it. But it's also why we want to learn something well the first time, because once you create these patterns, undoing these patterns can be a bit of a pain. And so that is, you know, an argument made for for having maybe a couple of lessons of something to get, you know, versus just doing it. But again, that's, you know, also theoretical, because if somebody's good at music, it doesn't probably really matter how they approach it. They're just going to be good at it, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, because you can really see it in the, in learning an instrument. So that's learned movement patterns that are stored in there. So that's kind of a cool stuff. So that is an area that influences the motor output patterns. And that so works very closely with that frontal cortex. And then we have another area that's really important and interesting, and that's the limbic system. And that's, an again, nuclei... Um, cell body structures in the deeper part of the brain. And that's this yellow thing here. It's kind of a weird looking thing. And that's the limbic system has to do with feelings and emotions. And it, it is, is, is how we experience the world affectively. That's what that calls. And so the we get emotional reactions that are executed there. But that's also an area where we have a very close relationship to then the emotion, the hypothalamus is there. Uh, uh, and then endocrine system. So that's where that also happens as well. So that's interesting. The, and the olfactory cortex is also in there. And that's an interesting thing. When you look at further down, I told you about the thalamus already. Maybe I didn't say the name. Where is my thalamus? Give me my thalamus. Really? Oh, there. So if we if we look at, we go away from the top layer, we go a little deeper towards the spinal cord, we're going to get through an area, they call that the diencephalon, but that's um, the main place there is the thalamus, and the hypothalamus is in the front of it, and the epithalamus is in the back of it, and the epithalamus, we have, I think, a slide further down that talks about that. That's where we make the cerebrospinal fluid from the blood. We excrete it from the blood and then put it in that subarachnoid space around the brain and also on the inside. So that's in that area. Uh, but the thalamus is is an area that where we have that that rudimentary consciousness. See, this is, you can see this is a, a face, but you have no idea who it is. Uh, but that rec level of recognition of consciousness happens in this area. And it's sort of a relay station where all the sensory information comes in and then gets distributed to the different parts, to the, the touch part, to the seeing part, and in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the occipital cortex, to the hearing part, in the temporal cortex, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there is one pathway that doesn't go through that thalamus as a sensory pathway, and that pathway is smell. And that's where we sort of left off when I talked about the limbic system. And the smell, the olfactory cortex, goes straight through the limbic system and activates emotions. And so that's one reason why when you look at sort of alternative therapies or, or things, uh, um, um, aromatherapy has, has its purpose because it, it goes straight bypasses the thalamus and goes straight into the uh, limbic system. And so like a, an, a, a lavender thing for a lot of people does, you know, create a much different internal reaction, you know, than having, you know, poop smell, for example. Uh, and that, you know, we could use that therapeutically. And so there is actually a real physiological anatomical explanation for that. So that's kind of an interesting part. But the limbic system also has other parts to it, not just the smelly parts, and the other thing that we often talk about is the amygdala hijack. And the amygdala is a part here in the limbic system, it's the red part. And that's, uh, 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 
re, is is reacting to fearful, angry facial expressions and danger assessments and 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 sort of like makes us go crazy sometimes and have a really strong re emotional reaction if that gets stimulated too much. And so that's like the oh my god moment versus you know the like no I thought about it it's not that big of a deal you know when we start thinking about it more consciously but that amygdala the hijack is when somebody loses their marbles and just goes crazy um, for a moment and just loses their shit and we all have it and it's just you know that way we understand it and hopefully what we can try to do over time is breathe a little bit deeper and, and try to think about it from the oh my god to like to like oh. You know, I'm going to get a little help or I can breathe through it. And it's not that bad as I thought in the first moment, um, which often happens too. But that's the infamous amygdala hijack right there. That also happens in the limbic system. So that's interesting. The other thing that happens in the limbic system is to, is, is memory. Uh, and that I talked about, I talked about um, memory creation. And that's the same process of getting used to it. The neurons that fire together, wire together. We talked about that already pretty extensively. So that also happens there. But it is interesting to see that memory and emotion work together. So it is very hard to be depressed and be able to um, uh, memorize things. So, or, or have, you know, or have you have to be in the right state of mind to do certain things, so to speak. Um, the central gyrus is right around that, and it's it's the gesture place. So I have that associated with sort of like we talk with our hands kind of thing. So that's another place. And again, that's how I look at the brain. It's like it pieces stuff together. Um, the hypothalamus, I got to speed it up a little bit, I guess. I'm sorry. If, well, we're almost done, actually. The hypothalamus is, is, is that connection where we have these... Uh, we talked about it ex fairly extensively, where we where we have a lot of functions in there. We have body temperature in there, emotions in there, autonomic nervous system stuff, um, and then it links to the pituitary gland with appetite, sleep, etc. Um, mind, and so we get we get into that psychosomatic part when we talk about the hypothalamus pretty fast, because we have the thinking stuff connected to the endocrine stuff via that pituitary gland. And so that's psychosomatic, somatopsychy. That's pretty cool stuff. And then behind that, we have that epithalamus. We talked briefly about it. The thalamus is here. The hypo was in the front and then the epi is behind. And that's where we make the cerebrospinal fluid that's described in here. Basically, the blood gets filtered and makes this whitish fluid that then goes around the brain and makes sure the brain doesn't collapse. So it has this buoyancy. And this is just anatomy. It describes the internal chambers there are that hold that cerebral spinal fluid. Um, the two on the outside are known as the lateral ventricles, lateral, you know, side. The one then they come together in the middle, right between the hypothalamus. So this is actually good to see where the thalamus is, it's deep inside. And then, and that's the third ventricle. And then it goes down to before that cerebellum, and that's the fourth ventricle. And this going down part is known as the cerebral aqueduct. And that's the terms for the anatomy of that. We talked about that. Um, then the then we go further down towards the spine or cord, and we have a few more structures. We have a midbrain here. Going, it's not really a full boundary structure, but it's just above that bulge, just the midbrain goes back and forth. And then we have the pons, here's the pons. That's where we have that bulge in the front. And then afterwards at the bottom, we have the medulla oblongata. It's a little more bulgy. And then further down, we got the spinal cord coming out of the skull, um, or actually about C2-ish. Um, the points here that I have right behind the pawns, there's these two bumps. And I kind of like these two bumps collectively. There's two on each side, so that makes four. So they call them corpora quadrigemini. Quadri means four. They have, and singularly on each side, we have a colliculus that's inferior and one that's superior. And those have to do with coordinating eye and hand movements when, um, when, and ear when triggered. So when you have an, a something happen in the periphery, for example, you're going to get um, the, the head moving towards that thing. And that is that trigger is in that super colliculus. The same is true when you hear, you know, bzzz, going by your ear, you're looking at it. 
that is triggered by the superior, I mean, the inferior colliculus. So that's kind of really cool because we kind of can put a, re, a thing that happens to that structure. So that one I actually have on the list because of that. Then this, we're not worried about these in terms of um, on the list. So you can do that in the quizzes, questions. The word peduncle refers to going in and out of the cerebellum. And for our purpose, the cerebellum has a lot to do with equilibrium. So when you think about you want to walk, you want to walk down the, to the to turn on the light. So the brain says, okay, we got to go turn on the light. So we walk, we send the impulse down. The basal ganglia goes like, okay, we can walk in rhythm because I've already done that before. And you can really see that in a little video I have somewhere about me learning how to walk as a little kid. My dad made a video. It's like the first is wobbly, the second time walking, it's already much more steady. And after the three, four times, you can walk. That's how fast the nervous system grows. It's very interesting. But anyway, then you walk and there is a hole in the floor and you didn't see it and you almost trip because you fall, your foot falls down. That's the balancing effect of the cerebellum then. And the cerebellum sends impulses down and reflexes down to balance out that situation. And so that can influence that pathway from that perspective. So the cerebellum has to do with balancing, with muscle tone, equilibrium, but also with planning on coordinating things. So that's another part of the balancing thing. So that's more modern times they figured out those kind of parts. And the pons is mainly connections, up and down connections and back and forth. That's why there's this bulge because so much stuff goes into the cerebellum. The cerebellum is said has as many neurons in it than the whole cerebrum has collectively. So that's how complicated the cerebellum is. And then the brainstem is the medulla oblongata is down in here. <clears throat> well, the brainstem is the whole thing here, but the medulla is at the bottom. And what we have there is one thing that's interesting. We have connections. We have the 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 everything that we execute on the right side of the brain or feel on the right side of the brain is happening or is going to affect the right left side of the brain and it's so it crosses over and this is an area where the motor neurons cross over the nerves that go from you know the right side of the the the, the precentral cortex that gyrus and affect the left muscles on the left side of the body so that's here and they call that decusation of the pyramids. The pyramids is a name they use because the nerve cell body looks like an upside down pyramid when they do like all these little dissection things. So that's sometimes they make names up really interestingly. And the olive is great because on the, on the model in class, the olive is green like an olive is often green. And, and that has to do with joint stretch and works with the cerebellum. So there's these bulges. And when you see a bulge like that, you probably have some cell bodies or like in the ponds, just a heavy amount of, um, of, of nerve fibers in it. Good. That's it for that. I am sorry. That took a lot of time, but does that helpful? No? Yes? Good? We're good? Yes, yes. I, I was having a hard time getting off mute. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay, and then, so let's just finish up briefly with this week coming up. Let's see what we got going on, and then we can qu quit, or I can stay around, depending on questions. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm always trying to read the pallets in the morning before I do the to Zoom. But the presentation throw me a little behind. So make sure you're, you know, connect with the presentation thing. Okay, so we have this week is week. Last week, we started to talk about the gratitude journal. I put it to the end of this week because it's, uh, you know, if you have to track something for five days and you start someday, then you still need five days. So that's why it's on the 30th. Uh, do so, but that make sure you don't forget about that. So that was from last week, because now we're in week 13 already. So, yeah, get to that second draft of the presentation so we can start making videos. Um, this week, we're going to talk about spinal cord and autonomic nervous and sensory nervous system. So that's pretty interesting stuff. That's a lot of video and questions here, basically. Uh, and then 
oh, look at that. We have a few things. And then there is a couple of, there's not that many terms. It's not like the brain with the colorings. So the terminology is much easier. Well, I don't know about easier, but much less numerous. And then we basically then have still the gratitude journal finishing up, as I said, and we also have an acuity screening test that I'm kind of doing um, as a health integration test that I want you to do. See, you have the chart here, the Snellen chart, you probably know. And uh, you can, if you can print that out, if not, send me a text. Actually, I can update that. I think I have a newer version where you actually can hold the barcode over to go to an app. And so I basically want you to, you know, do a little screening about your acuity of vision. And that's like, you know, that's the, how, how good is your vision? And so that that's an integration, uh, I think, as an interesting exercise, because if we don't go to the optometrist, it's good to know about just the screening. We could do that with the kids, for example, and go like, hey, fundamentally, you know, it doesn't replace an optometry appointment, obviously, but sometimes, you know, we don't get everything all the time. What if I what if I recently got a refraction done? Can I use that for this assignment? Yeah. Because I just got, I just, <laughs> my, my eyes are getting worse the older I get. Yeah, no, no. For so me, I the main, the main part, position. the main part is integration of the information that we're learning. So if you already uh -huh. done stuff just recently, then that's fine. Okay. You know, but, but make also make sure you know the process of doing the, that, that screening so you can you know do it with well no a refraction a is, tell other people about it because yeah no again, that a refraction is what you're asking us to do with those little letters that's yeah then do then do then do that it. then do that again if you can print it out okay. and i'll actually update the activity to also even give you a phone app i think there's i did some research um after i finished hours this semester so i'll update that Okay, so that's pretty much it, I think. Uh, how are you guys doing with that? Any more questions? Nope, I'm about to get to work. Um, I got a few. You're, you're. I'm gonna. You're gonna have a lot coming from me, so. Okay. <laughs> you well, won't get bored. You have a lot of work to do this week. That's for sure. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, you know. I know. Sometimes it's a little more. Well, keep keep up with the presentations and just shoot me stuff. Send me stuff. You know, today I'm going to that do I the, can um, go work on it. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. And let me know if it's helpful that I'm giving whatever I'm giving you from Commons perspective, so I can okay. also make it better on my end. All right. Will do. All right, good. With that, peace, have a good peace. Have a good week, everyone. You too. Peace out. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.